my dear friends, I ought to introduce Nuruddin Farah to you, but that seems to me rather facile. Because for the last two weeks that he has been with us, he has become virtually like our family. I had expected that a distinguished writer would be very stiff and very formal, but Nuruddin was disarming in his humility and extremely generous with his friendship. I have tried to involve you a great deal, sir, in our talks, seminars and academic sessions and given you no time to do your writing. So first of all, I want you to forgive us for not sparing you any time to do your real work. Nuruddin Farah is an exile. We often use the word exile as a noun. The word then begins to insinuate that exile is a condition that the exile carries with him all the time. To say then that Nuruddin Farah is an exile is to speak of the pain of leaving behind his land, sights and sounds, landscape, memories, family and loved ones, folklore and myth. But Nuruddin Farah in exile finds another home. In fact, he finds several homes. Being in exile, fortunately, gives him the creative space and an energy. As an itinerant writer, he has moved across borders, becoming the metaphor of a traveler in a multilingual world. This is probably what he meant at his colloquium lecture when he said that all stories are but one story. Farah has lived in many countries, in Africa and all over the world. Nevertheless, he remains rooted in the cultural and political history of Somalia. That's where he comes from. He is someone who carries his land within his heart, in spite of being in exile for over 18 years. And yet his success lies in transcending those strong bonds and affiliations with nation, language and religion. But we know his work is integral to Africa and particularly to Somalia and its civil war, which has had a tremendous impact on him. Nuruddin Farah can thus translate himself back into history, from disempowerment to empowerment. His work therefore moves from containment and domination to a living dialogue between its own cultural past and present as also between its culture and the culture of other lands. In my opinion, in my meetings with Nuruddin Farah, I find him often engaged in a robust dialogue between the multilingual cultural history and the contemporary as also between local cultures and cultures around the globe. This is the strength of the condition of the exile. Indeed, he is both transnational and translational and his consciousness spans both. He translates his countrymen from passive victimized objects into subjects who begin to recognize that they are in charge of their destinies. His desire has never been to reinforce identity, but to reach a plane where all literary practice is motivated by the love of knowledge and by the abnegation of narrow national or cultural boundaries. He has sought truth by stepping beyond his linguistic and cultural confines. Nuruddin Farah, we are delighted today to have you with us. May I request you now to give us some readings from your choice of your books. I invite Nuruddin Farah.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back after many, many years. I'm going to be reading this morning from three novels, not necessarily long passages, but I've also decided to include reading from my first novel, which I wrote when I was a student at Government College, Chandigarh. I was 21, 22 when I, I was here for three years and I, three and a half years, and I wrote three novels, so that meant actually that I probably wasn't a good student. I'll read the prologue. He could only curse. That was all he could do. Other than that, he could give advice. But now he cursed. He squatted on the ground, on the dirty ground. His featherweight body lay, and he couldn't weigh more than 60 pounds. He grasped a rosary very tightly. In close examination, one would think that he was seeking support from the string. His arms were stretched forward, and his buttocks were resting on his heels. He had no shoes on. He was an old man, about 80 or even 90. He could have been even more than that, and he could possibly have been less. At the time when he was born, nobody bothered about the date of birth of a child. A child would be one year old even if his birthday fell on the last day of spring. Spring was what counted. The three months of spring meant everything for human beings as well as for animals. Weddings were arranged in spring, wars were undertaken in spring, blessings of the saints were sought in spring, clan wars were either started or ended in spring. Spring therefore meant everything. It meant happiness, it meant green pasture for the cattle, it meant a great quantity of milk from the cattle which also meant agricultural prosperity for some. The old man squinted to see who was coming towards him. It was his grandson, the brother of Ebla, his granddaughter, who had run away and had eloped with a man. Nobody knew for certain. The young boy also squatted on the ground, rocked his hands on his uncovered lap, then let his hand go through his dark, wavy, unwashed hair, which was <coughs> full of dandruff. He was about 16, but being the only son of a family, whose mother and father had both died a long time ago, hard labour had aged him. He had a piece of cloth to cover his rough body. Rough because nothing protected it from the sun or the thorn bushes which he walked over when herding the camels. She has gone away, he said. We know that for certain. The old man kept silent. Maybe he was meditating. The young boy looked sorrowfully down at the ground. The old man 
counted the beads of his rosary. There were 99 of them, which represented the names of God. He was totally emaciated. His colleagues in this world had departed back to God a long time ago. The people in the area wondered if he would ever die. When spoken to, he would narrate the minutest detail of the story, the war between Sayyid Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, a Somali warrior, and the British. But now, he could not keep silent. He was an old man, and his main duty was to give advice. To refer to the days before the others were born. To talk about the rainy season to come. To say what one should do. Although nobody cared what he thought, the old man had many things to say to the middle-aged as well as to the youngsters. The latter group were not as attentive to his word as the former. Maybe because the young blood in them made them vigorous and rebellious, he thought. His granddaughter's sudden departure had killed many things in him, although he did not know why. He had witnessed women of her age running away from families into the bosom of a man to get married. He had seen many such incidents. He had done it himself. Or rather, his wife had done it for him. But what made it quite sinister was the fact that he had nobody else to look after him. He had looked, he had loved her, sorry, more than he loved anybody else when he had the power to love. He loved her more than he loved his own eyes, and now he goes, and he said, May the Lord take me away, if Ebla dies, before myself, he used to say. The old man pursed his lips and became nervous. He shivered in spite of the heat, and his soft flesh quivered as if beaten by the wind. He gripped the beads of the rosary slightly. Alhamdulillah, astaghfirullah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, astaghfirullah, subhanallah. He prayed. He repeated and repeated the words, the words that aged with him. He must have said them more or less more than a hundred billion times. But they were on the tips of his tongue today, conveying no message, other than the vibration of the vocal cord. This, then this, the string snapped under the old man's weak fingers, and the beads ran away. and into the hot sand. The young boy stopped to collect the head, the beads for him, but the old man slowly shook his head. He motioned to the boy to go away. The old man very softly and quietly said his curse. May the Lord disperse your plans. Ebla, Ebla is the name of the girl. May he make you the mother of many a bastard. May he give you hell on this earth as a reward. The boy ran away and told two other old men about his grandfather. When they came, they found him lying on the ground. He could have been dead, he could have been alive, but no one went near him. He was an old man 
no doubt, and either could have been possible. Thank you. Now I will read from my most recent novel, and the distance in years between the first novel from what I have just read and this novel is almost, almost 50 years. On his desk in the office are has three photographs, one of each of, who, of his two teenage children and a third, the photo of a very beautiful woman which occupies center stage. Unless he tells them who the woman is, nearly everyone assumes she is his wife the mother of his children. But if they ask and he tells them that she is his sister, their faces turn sad as if they are sorry that she is not his woman. In a dream just before dawn, are keeps trying to corral a dozen ground squirrels into his apartment. Time and again, he fails miserably. In spite of this, he doesn't give up. And eventually he rounds up quite a few of them. But just as he attempts to shut the door on the last of the lot, he notices in the hallway the presence of a familiar figure, Valerie, whom he thinks of as his former wife. Although they have never actually divorced. But what on earth is Valerie doing there now, he asks himself. And why are the ground squirrels gathering around her, looking eagerly up at her as if she might offer them treats? Indeed, Valerie is wearing an apron with huge pockets from which she begins extracting seeds, nuts, dead insects, and other tidbits that she feeds to the rodents. Enraged, he utters a few choice expletives under his breath. Then he resumes his efforts to rally those near him. But he feels he hasn't a chance in hell to lure away the ones that are happily feeding around her. He doubts if he will succeed in doing what he has set out to do. Ar hasn't set eyes on Valerie since she disappeared from his life and that of his children a decade ago. Why would she make this sudden reappearance in his life here in Mogadishu, where he is living for only a short while, or rather, in his dream there? And come to think of it, what have run squirrels to do with her, or with either of them, for that matter? He watches in bemusement as some of the creatures, having eaten their fill, pirouette for the other, who are broad as squirrels do. 
raising their on their hand legs and touching their palms together. Why is Valerie back in his life at just the point when he no longer misses her? Our heart expands with great sorrow, yet he won't admit defeat. He triples his endeavor to pen in as many squirrels as he can, singling out the sated ones, to surrender more easily to his will. But when no more snacks are forthcoming, they look confused and some manage to give him the slip, while others come and go, entering the room at his behest and departing again as Valerie's insistence. In the ensuing chaos, with neither Valerie nor R willing to back down, frenzy sets in. And the poor things begin pushing and shoving one another, looking helpless and lost. Just then, R feels the quiet presence of someone else on the periphery of his vision. A woman, elegantly dressed all in black, is placing, is placing a tripod within shooting distance and mounting a compact digital camera on it. Busy attending to the squirrels, Valerie did not make, did not take any notice of her. But I recognizes Bella, his sister, and wonders how come she did not bother to email him to alert him of her arrival. How bizarre and how unlike her. They had last met in Istanbul when he was on his way to his current posting in Somalia. She had flown in from Brazil and they had spent nearly a week together. But here she is in his birth city where she hasn't set foot in since 1991. When the two of them fled the fighting in Mogadishu with their mother, first to Nairobi in a refugee camp and then to Rome. Silent, he watches Bella as she approaches and adjusts the position of her camera. A shadow lengthening, a face widening in a knowing grin as her eyes encounter his. He is relaxed, no longer worried. Bella, no more than anyone, gives him comfort. And Bella, more than anyone else, discomforts Valerie. Because if there is anything Valerie hates, it's having her picture taken when she isn't prepared for it. And lo and behold, the minute Valerie's eyes fix on Bella's camera and its attendant paraphernalia. She begins to make ponderous and gangly movements. Hardly has another moment passed before she beats the undignified retreat of a vanquished rival, slinking away without so much as a word of self justification or apology. And R herds all the ground squirrels in, and he's delighted. Thank you again. Now I I write for some reason I haven't quite worked out. I write trilogies, and so I have now I have now uh, read from two different trilogies, and I will read from a third one, so that, uh, and then I usually think, uh, maybe because I'm long-winded, I have no idea why I write trilogies, and maybe somebody else will tell me uh, why I do so. 
Now, this is the trilogy, and this novel maps. I wrote in 1985, and it came out. Uh, caused me a lot of problems in the sense that it took the oxygen, oxygen out of all the other books. And then I decided to take it out of print so that the other books could get a life. And then, fortunately again, it was back. Now, Maps is different from most of the other novels in that it's narrated in three different persona, you, I, and he. So what I'll do today is I will only confine myself to two uh, other persona, an I passages from the I section and passages from the you section. The man, the man who was brought to circumcise me when my turn came, made me sit alone, insisted that I read a few chronic verses of my choice, and that I wait for him as he honed the knife he was going to use uh, he was going to use against a sharp stone he had come along with. I was overcome by fear. Fear of pain, fear of being lonely, fear of being separated forever from Mistra. She wasn't there anyway. She wasn't allowed to come. In her place there came a man one of my many uncles. The sticky saliva in my mouth, the drumming of fright beating in my ears, the numbness of my body wherever I touched, felt. My legs, my hands, my thighs, my sex with pain. Then a man asked me to look up at the heavens and to concentrate on anything my eyes fell on. There was an aperture in the clouds and there was a bird which I spotted, a bird flying high and in haste towards the opening in the heavens. I concentrated on the bird's movements, concentrated on it, until it became a dot in the heavenly distance. To mask my fear, I invested all my energy in the look. And the bird's flight reminded me of similar flights of my own fantasies. When I looked again, I couldn't see the bird. I could only see a tapestry of clouds which were woven in order to provide the bird with a hiding place. The world, I told myself, was in my eyes and the bird had flown away with it, carrying it in its beak, light as a straw, small as an atom. Now that I had lost sight of the bird, I wasn't sure if it was an eagle or a hawk. There was nothing but sunlight for a long while, and the sun was in my eyes and it blinded me to the rest of the cosmos. Until the bird re-emerged out of the sun's brightness, beautiful, feminine, playful, and it became again the center of my world and I was inside of it, in flight, had light as are children's fantasies, impervious to the realities surrounding me and then sudden as 
bushfire sack. It is such a horrid territory, the territory of pain. And I crossed it alone. No thought of Mitra, no amount of conservatory remarks made by the uncle who had come with me and no verses of the Quran would have reduced the pain or even eliminated it altogether. Do I remember when the pain lodged in my body, which it lived in for almost a month thereafter? It entered my groin first, or rather, that's what I seem to remember. I recall thinking that I had seen the bird's apparition and that the rest of the world had been small as a speck in the sky then the man pulled at the foreskin of my manhood, producing first in my groin, then in the remaining parts of my body, a pain so acute my ears were set ablaze with dolorous flames. These flames spread gradually. Then my feet felt frozen, my eyes warm with tears, my cheeks moist with crying, and my throat dry as a desert. It was only then that I looked and I saw blood. A pool of blood in whose waters I swam and which helped me cross to the other side so I would become a man once and for all. I saw the man break an egg. I couldn't tell why he did so. Perhaps the idea was to reduce the pain or help stop my losing any more blood. I thought that, was the, that the white and yellow of the egg mixed well with my own blood and the colours which I saw, the beauty which I beheld, took the pain away for a few minutes. My bare thighs were spotted with cold sprouts of painted hair and I rubbed them, smoothing the hair erections so the blood would return. I was held to stand, I don't remember by whom, and was led away from the spot that I had been sitting on. Possibly the eggshell with the hat my man had wore, possibly not. Possibly once the skin was pushed back, I was bandaged with cotton or other similar material. Although I cannot remember anything except the pain which made me faint, I awoke alone on a bed. You sit in contemplative posture, your features agonized, and your expressions pained. You sit for hours and hours and hours, sleepless, looking into darkness, hearing a small snore coming from the room next to yours and you conjure a past, a past in which you see a horse drop its rider, a past in which you notice a bird breaking out of its shell so it will fly into the heavens of freedom. Out of the same past emerges a man wrapped in a mantle with unpatched holes each hole large as a window, each window large as the secret to which you cling as if it were the only soul you possess. And you question, you challenge every thought that crosses your mind. Yes, you are a question to yourself, 
It is true. You have become a question to all those who meet you, those who know you, those who have any dealings with you. You doubt at times if you exist outside your own thoughts, outside your own head or mistress. It appears as if you were a creature given birth to by notions formulated in heads, a creature brought into being by ideas. As if you were not a child born with a fortune or misfortune of its stars, a child bearing a name, breathing just like anybody else, a child whose activities are justifiably part of a people's past and present. You exist, you think, the way the heavenly bodies exist. For although one does extend one's, one's finger and point at the heavens, one knows, yes, that's the word, one knows that there is, that that is not the heavens. Unless, unless there are, in a sense, as many heavens as there are thinking beings, unless there are as many heavens as there are pointing fingers. At times when your uncle speaks about you in your presence, referring to you in the third person, and on occasion even taking the liberty of speaking on your behalf, you wonder if your existence is readily differentiable from creatures of fiction whom habit has taught one to talk of as if they are one's closest friends. Creatures of fiction with whose manner of speech, reactions to situations, conditions of being, and with whose likes and dislikes one's folk tradition has made one familiar. From your limited knowledge of literature, you feel you are a blood relation of some of the names which come to mind, leap to the tongue at the thought of a young boy whose name is Asuka and whose prodigious imagination is capable of wealthy signs of precocity because you are this young boy. As you sit contemplatively, your mind journeys to a region where there are solid and prominent shadows which live on behalf of others who had years before ceased to exist. As you sit, your eyes open into themselves, the way blind people tend to. Then you become numb of soul. In other words, you're no longer yourself, not quite yourself anyway. The journey then takes you through numerous doorways and you are able to call back to memory events which occurred long before you were even born. Your travel leads you through forests without any clearing, to stone steps too numerous to count, Although when you reach the highest point, your exhaustion disappears the instant you see an old man, grey as his advanced years, negotiate the steps too. You remember now that in the wake of the old man, there was a girl, barely seven, following the old man as a goat follows, a butcher knowing what knives of destiny awaited. And you, you who had lain in wait unwashed, you who had lain unattended to at birth, yes, you lay in wait as if in ambush until a woman who wasn't expecting that you existed, walked into the dark room in which you had been from the second you were born. You were 
a mess. You were a most terrible sight. The woman who found you described the chill of that dark room as a tomb. To her, the air suggested the dampness of a mortuary. You cried at her approaching and would not be calmed until she dipped you in the bathtub she had filled with warm water. Then she fed you on a draught of goat's milk. Did anyone ever tell you what you looked like? When the woman discovered you that dusk some 18 or so years ago? No. You were on you wore on your head a hat of blood, which made you look like a masked clown. And around your neck there were finger stains, perhaps your mother's. Nobody knows to this day whether she tried to kill you or not. You displayed a nervous strain and you began to relax only when embraced either by another person or dipped in warm water. When you didn't cry, you searched with your hands up in the air for somebody to touch. When day broke, once the woman had shared the secret of her discovery with a few of the other neighbors, the men took over and they prepared your mother for burial. Alone with you, Mesra, the woman who found you, Notice that your eyes were full of mistrust. They focused on her. They stared at her hands suspiciously. Your eyes, she would say years later, journeyed through her. They journeyed beyond her. They traveled to a past of unfulfilled dreams. In short, your stare made her feel inadequate. There was an element of self-consciousness self in the small thing I had found, she said. It was so self-conscious. It moved its hands as if it would wipe away the mess it had been in. It moved its eyes when not staring at me, she continued, as though apologizing for its shortcomings. And what eyes? and what hands, and I thank you.